Much like Baywatch Nights itself, Baywatching Nights is full of missed opportunities. For instance, I could have mentioned Charmed in the Witchcraft episode since Daryl is in it, or the episode of Baywatch proper with the aliens in the strike, but I didn't. I will forever be haunted by the specter of jokes not taken. And speaking of specters, this episode is about ghosts, kinda. The script was written by William A. Schwartz, whose only other involvement with Baywatch happened way back in season one. I wasn't able to determine the relationship, but I'm absolutely certain this is more Baywatch nepotism in regards to Douglas Schwartz. I don't think the quality has taken a noticeable dive from their usual golden standards or anything, just noting it. Anyway, the cabin. We open on a cabin. A stunt lady is selling the hell out of some falls as she runs away from an old-timey prospector. Presumably, this is the ghost of Mitch's uncle who left him that treasure map that one time. This time, the editing is purposefully weird and not just confusing for the hell of it, as she falls down the stairs and fades outside. Prospector Man has a spooky filter on his shots. Whoa! Bold of them to edit this episode on Video Toaster. Sure, a stupid transition kind of undercuts the terror of that scene, but it was worth it because damn did that look cool. But not cooler than Mitch Von Malibu, who has just been gifted a fire axe from the 1800s for pulling a kid out of a burning car. Yes, this shitty rubber prop axe they didn't even try to make look old is supposed to be from the 1800s and is a very normal thing to be gifted for saving someone's life. We are only a minute and a half in. Not just a fire axe, one of the great fire axes of all time. And I should know, I have a poster listing the all-time greatest fire axes, and this is at the very top. Mitch is extremely proud of his all-time greatest fire axe from the 1800s that they apparently ruined by sticking on a shitty plaque commemorating how awesome he is, so he is willing to display it at his detective agency and far away from his actual house. Uh, oh. What do you know about fire axes, Mitch? Actually, I want to talk to you about things that go bump in the night. Things that go bump in the night. Do you believe in ghosts? No. Well, Eddie once encountered a woman who may or may not have been a ghost, and Summer was possessed by one, but I wasn't directly involved with those plots, so I'm not really sure. Also, I guess I was a ghost one time, but technically that was an out-of-body experience, so I'm choosing not to count it. Teague wants Ryan and Mitch to visit the haunted cabin with him. Why them? Every ghost hunt needs a skeptic. This may be the one time Mitch's involvement actually seems justified. On the drive over, Ryan literally reads the dictionary definition of a ghost. Because for a show that doesn't like explaining anything, they sure do think the audience is stupid. The dictionary definition of a ghost. Time filled. Mitch has brought out his trademark beige vest, so you know this is going to be a thorough investigation. Are you sure this is the place? Let me check. Yep. Thorough. While Ryan muses that the place doesn't look that scary, this gives Mitch a chance to talk more about his family tree. When I think of haunted, I think of Aunt Tilly kicking off and hanging around long enough to make sure that Uncle John doesn't hook up with some floozy. Assuming this isn't a hypothetical aunt and uncle, we now know Mitch had an Aunt Tilly married to an Uncle John, an Uncle Jerry who thinks life stinks and then you die, a loaded Aunt Clara who's willing to pretend to be in a romance with him while undercover as a gigolo, and of course, a gold prospector uncle who was killed and left him a treasure map, who I think is on his father's side. I am participating in this weekend because I'm a scientist. And unlike you, I believe in the paranormal. That makes me the Scully and the Mulder. I provide the rational and paranormal explanations while you complain about being hungry. That's what makes us such a good pair, providing what the other one needs. Anyway, as a scientist, Ryan thinks Mitch is a big fat chicken for listening to Teague when he told them to wait for him. This insult rolls off like water on a Mitch's back because he knows she's really saying that because she thinks he's hot. Because competition is your middle name and subconsciously you're attracted to me and it's a way of getting my attention. The male ego is a disease. I think once you've kissed and she blatantly told you you were her type and she also asked you drunkenly to have sex with her, it's not subconscious anymore, Mitch. Mitch doesn't actually give a shit about Teague, though, especially when Ryan points out that they need to get the groceries in the fridge. Because, adorably, they've brought groceries to the ghost hunt. This is a cabin Teague ominously told them was too dangerous to go in alone, and Mitch was like, bring the ruffles! I don't know if this shaky shot is supposed to be from a ghost POV, or it just sucks. Whoa, some haunted house. Was it a good idea to have Mitch become the audience proxy and point out how asinine things have become, or a great idea? You know, I never realized how judgmental you are. Me? Judgmental? Ha! It's the most ridiculous thing you've ever heard. 
That is a good one, Mitch. And now that they're inside, Ryan has completely changed her mind and thinks that Mitch is being totally closed-minded by saying this place doesn't look like it could be haunted. You walk in, you take a look around. Oh, this place can't be haunted. It's just not what you think of when someone says haunted. I'm not really clear on why Ryan uses the specific adjective judgmental here. I mean, Mitch is judgmental, but like, he's judging a cabin, so like, who cares? Ah. Oh boy, time to judge. Following a secret hallway while calling out to Ryan, who ignores him, I guess, Mitch eventually comes across some old-timey stuff. Some singing is coming from the bathroom, and he finds Destiny's ghost in the tub! Oh my god! Now we can finally find out what happened to her! Where, where has she been since season one? Why didn't any of the characters mention her or remember she existed? Did Teague get rid of her once he found out she was psychic? Does she know the fate Baywatch Nights has in store? I'm just kidding. It would have been kind of cool if they did that. Instead, Lisa Stahl is just here playing a random ghost from the 1800s, and no mention is made of the fact she looks exactly like their old friend who was a main character last season. Pretty cool show. Destiny's ghost tells Mitch to strip down and get in the tub, and I don't know if she thinks he can magically shrink to hide in there, or the prospector ghost would prefer to find them naked together. Faulty ghost logic, I guess. Give me back my treasure map, you son of a Mitch! Yes, everyone, that is the opening credits, and we are 10 minutes into the episode. That is one-fourth of the way in, my friends. Meanwhile, Ryan is still somehow sorting through groceries. Mitch is convinced these are ghosts now, but I'm not sure what changed his mind. These ghosts are not friendly like Casper! Just like a ghost. Some creepy stuff is going on for sure, as Mitch is now stuck in some sort of otherworldly maze Ryan doesn't have access to. They can talk to each other, but they're separated by ghostly forces. None of it's real. It's just a bunch of ghosts and illusions. It's maybe something with the light, maybe some molecular imaging. But trust me, Mitch, it is not real, okay? All right, stop. That is a whole lot of nonsense you were throwing out here. Okay, so Ryan is basically saying this is all fake because it's probably ghost magic, or maybe a hologram, or maybe molecular imaging? Do you know what molecular imaging is? Also, you are talking to him from the same room in different dimensions. Is that something that can be done with a trick of the light? And wasn't Ryan the one who believes in the paranormal, but now she's poo-pooing all over him? Choose a characterization show, choose one! Ryan tries to leave and call for help, but instead she finds the opening credits still happening 15 minutes in. Danny Woodburn Ghost is waiting around to ask her to get naked, because all these ghosts want Mitch and Ryan naked. This is his second appearance in the Baywatch universe, but he will have to wait until season 9 of The Parent Show to play someone who isn't a fantasy creature. Anyway, I guess this place is a brothel, and Prospector Man's wife worked there, and he went on a jealous killing spree. A ghost prostitute tries to hit on Mitch, and she gets axed down by Prospector Spectre Man. Daughter of Jezebel! <laughs> Question, is his axe supposed to be related to the axe that Mitch was gifted? Because if so, I really don't think a serial killer fire axe should be counted as one of the greatest fire axes of all time. Someone should talk to the fire axe committee about this oversight. What the fuck is this? Your worst nightmare, butthorn! Help me! Mitch, you cannot make out with every ghost that looks exactly like your psychic friend Destiny. You're just setting yourself up for heartbreak. I will say, if I can give season two any credit here, I think for once the show's confusion is working in their favor. The trippy time loop sequences and spatial displacement is sometimes used to good effect, and I think this episode is more ambitious than their usual fare. Maybe William Schwartz was onto something. Maybe, given an infinite amount of time, a monkey hitting a keyboard could produce an episode of Baywatch Nights with some promise. You all right? Then again, maybe there's a lifeguard tower in this cabin for some fucking reason. Whatever. That's right, it's me, Evil Mitch. I love dogs and hate red meat. No, that's impossible. I'm both humble and love my son. No! Baywatch is going to run for four more seasons. Stop torturing me. And you won't even be in the last one. Oh, thank God. It's worse than you think, though. And the season will be interminable. At least I'll be living my life happily elsewhere. Oh, you poor dumb bastard. 
Much like the dumpster chasing Mitch down an alley, this is the perfect visual metaphor for Baywatch Nights. Lifeguard Mitch and P.I. Mitch, forever at odds, each struggling to take control. One is the vision of Mitch's success, and the other, his unfulfilled dreams. Slowly, the Earth is swallowing up P.I. Mitch, caught in the gaping maw of the beach he once loved. He will never escape. Subtext. What the hell is subtext? <coughs> Brian! If you can hear me, I want you to pass on a message to Hobie. It's gonna contain a lot of expletives, so you might want to write it down for him to read later. Wait, Ryan, the door's back. I'm glad this quicksand situation solved itself, I guess. Anyway, that had nothing to do with anything, and we're back to wandering in hallways. Just want to point out, all of this is happening because these two couldn't wait less than 30 minutes for Teague. Hmm, how will Mitch get out of this one? Ah, I don't know. Have him burst through a ghost dimension like the Kool-Aid man. Why not? Oh, yeah! Mitch, Mitch are, you are you okay? okay? I'm, I'm fine, fine, Ryan. Ryan. This, is, this very is very important. important. Now listen, listen. Did, you did you get, get the, the groceries, groceries in the, in the fridge? fridge? Ryan points out it's 10.45, meaning Teague is late. Probably got caught up spritzing some flowers and lost track of the time of the demons. He's not the only one whose time is off. Mitch has 12 on his watch, and according to Ryan, that means he's in a different year altogether. I'm not sure how time travel would change how fast his watch works when they seem to be going in the same sink as each other, but uh, maybe time works differently for him. So now, on top of ghosts, we've got time warps. Mitch has gone back to a time before Hobie existed, and burgers were invented in the late 1800s, so he's basically in the perfect era. We have to touch! We have to make a physical connection! Is this another one of your theories, or are you sure? Touch my hand, Mitch. It'll bring us together. I don't know, Ryan. I'm not touching your icky hand until I'm sure your theory is correct. Maybe I kinda like it here with the murderous prospector and my evil lifeguard self. Wow. Hard to believe the show wasn't nominated for an Emmy. Wait, so just anyone who falls down the stairs will get outside? Seems like an easily exploited flaw in the ghost security system, if you ask me. What happened? I haven't been able to ask anyone cryptic questions in like 30 minutes, and who can wait that long for anything? Yeah, I guess Ryan hasn't been haunted by demonic spirits since last episode, so now she's the one stuck in the time travel brothel. I still don't really understand exactly what's going on, but maybe T can shed some light on the situation. What is haunted about a house is the place, not the time. Time is never constant, only a place. Time is a continuum. Well, those sure were some words. I won't ask you to get naked and hide in the tub, Ryan, because even though I'm a spirit caught in a time loop, I can't say anything that could be construed as gay. Destiny, you can see the future. Do Mitch and I ever get together? Oh, baby, 16 episodes from now, you won't even get a passing mansion. Ryan must use her smarts to get out of this situation. Figuring she can reason with Prospector Man, she asks him to tell her all about his horrible harlot wife that sent him on a killing spree. Well, I suppose it all began when she found me chewing on a rat while I was out gold prospecting. Being 1890-whatever, there was basically nothing else to do. She found my resourcefulness charming, and I liked that she had most of her teeth. Seeing as how she was 14, she was basically an old maid with no other options. It was a timeless romance, up until she decided she wanted to work at a brothel by day and as a P.I. by night. I told her no, but she wouldn't listen. Anyway, long story short, that's why I hacked everyone to pieces. <laughs> Boy, you know, when I say it out loud, it just sounds crazy. There's some bad sound effects in there. I'm going back in. <laughs> was that supposed to be Ryan? You're not the only one. Good luck, Teague. Good luck, Teague. Ah, he just disappeared. Okay. Pretty spooky, huh, folks? But not as spooky as this twist. Mitch, wake up. What happened? You keeled over. What? No, 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 no. You don't just go to commercial and then come back and say this was all a fucking dream? How does- no! This makes no sense! Why would- why would the whole episode be a dream when they encounter things like this all the time anyway? And also, why was he seeing things from Ryan's perspective? And, and what was that scene in the opening all about? That happened before he hit his head! Wh why? Why? Oh, I had a horrible dream. And you were there, Ryan? And you were there, Teague? And the groceries! Are they still in the fridge? What's their expiration dates? Now that you're feeling better, we have to get on the road. I have a full crew meeting us at the haunted house. So I think I'll pass on the haunted house. I have to go. I will speak to you later. 
Wait, he could just say no this whole time and Teague easily gives up? Since when? Oh my god, Mitch, what happened to your arm? Wait, so this... <sighs> it was a Freddy Krueger type dream about a haunted time warp cabin that might have also been a prophecy about the real cabin Teague wanted them to go to? I'm not going to sleep for a very long time. Next time on Baywatch, CJ's mom comes to town from Vegas. Will the Baywatch team be able to save her from Shawn Michaels and his vest? Snake eyes!